give your fear that's based around anxiety a name, then you can tell it to get lost. I've had kids name it uh, actual name like Gertrude or Fred. Um, I've had other kids name it Mr. What If or the monster I hate. It really doesn't matter what it is as long as it comes from you and it's something that you can straight up call it. Mr. Anxiety, there you are again. No, we are going to handle this differently today. We're going to try something new. The truth is you are not your anxiety. And you can leave that anxiety in the dust when you step forward into the amazing future that you were meant to live. But I'll tell you what, give it a name. See what difference it makes. Now, I take kids and I actually have them draw a picture of their little monster that's within them that they that's fear. And I get the cutest little drawings. Hey, you should do it too. Draw a drawing. Draw the little angry face and the hair all over the place and then realize, wait a minute, this is, and then give it a name. I, I'm so hesitant to think of any particular name on this podcast because you might have that name and then you're like, oh, I can't believe that she just called it that. I mean, picture yourself talking to someone across the table and you're talking to them and you're giving them advice of what they're going to do. Sometimes it just flows out. You're like, yeah, I know exactly what they need to do. And you talk to them. And then later on, you might think, oh, maybe I need to take some of that advice and give it to myself. That's kind of the trick you're playing with your mind. And your mind needs little tricks like this to get over social anxiety. You need to talk to your anxiety like it's something across the room, across the table and say, hey, hold on a second. I see you're telling me this whole big old story. Nah, -uh, not today. All right. So that's step one. Name it. Think of a name and then don't be afraid to talk to it like it's right across the room and give it what it needs, a kick in the pants. <laughs> the next thing is create a new narrative. What you do is you clearly, clearly define a picture of what you would like it to be like the next time you walk into the social situation that is worrying you. And you've got to think of the colors and the smells and the things that are the the uh, the little tiny things like what people say that you enjoy, what makes you laugh, what's the humor in it, what's your absolute favorite part about that event. Build a narrative, even journal about it. And you are developing such a bright and beautiful picture that it is, it's like the bright sunshine. And the other narrative that's developed around anxiety seems dim. And that seems to be so dim that it is just in the background because you have a brighter, more vivid picture of what you prefer, what you really want it to be like, what you know that it could be like. You can attach this to one of your favorite memories related to the same topic. This especially helps if you feel that the anxiety has heightened and at one point you were dealing with it a little bit better. Well, think back to that one point. Think about your very favorite time that you did this same activity, how it felt. Allow yourself to smile. Allow yourself to think about it. Make a list of all the benefits, all the way that it helps you. Because you're, you are craving all of those positive things and don't even realize it. You want them in your life so desperately. I was so inspired to do this podcast after an amazing conversation that I had with my daughter. She has been dealing with social anxiety her whole life. And I'm ashamed to say that early on when she was a child, I didn't recognize it as such. And I did not always deal with it well. I was the mom that made the mistake many times of dismissing or um, being a little bit too harsh with forcing her to do the activity that I knew was best for her. And it is hard sometimes to face that fact and face the reality that my daughter is ha having to sort out how to really cope with social anxiety more in her adult life, rather be than being able to really sort it out in a more healthy way in her childhood. Now, that's not to say that we didn't make strides forward, but the real debilitation of social anxiety happens in your mind. 
And my daughter was telling me about memories she had when she coped with it in college. And I wasn't with her. She was in another state. And she talked about how now that she's uh, again revisiting some of those things because, you know, she's uh, entering into all these brand new activities right now and starting a new church and all this kind of stuff. She's remembering back when she was uh, in college and things I wouldn't know or nobody knows when she just quietly opted out of situations. Why? Because of the narrative that was in her mind became so loud and so big that she just said, "Uh uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. I was so interested in listening to her and finding out how she's uh, dealing with that battle even today. And I know that you might be battling that very same thing. The reason I pause right here at step number two of building your own narrative is because I realize that the narrative that anxiety has is forming within your mind, it really does talk you out of situations. It talks you out of going places. It talks you out of leaving on time and, and doing the things you need to do. And I want to encourage you to take the steps of building a bright and beautiful narrative surrounded around the things that you're going to be doing in your life and giving yourself all of the reasons beforehand why it is going to be a huge benefit to you. And an anxiety can be such a strong voice that it can actually use some of the reasons that you're giving yourself of why it's so important that you work towards conquering this social anxiety and being able to move forward it begins to say, see, that's why you shouldn't even try. Because if it attacks, you might hurt those around you. Remember that those around you are rooting for you. They might not understand it. They might not have ever felt it before in their body the way that you do, but they're rooting for you and they want you to be a part of their life in a way that brings you joy and peace. Now, if this isn't you and it's your child, as it was for me, I encourage you so strongly to not make the mistake that I did to get stuck in only helping your child go where they need to go and get over it. Rather, have compassion. Listen to them. Maybe go through those 10 things with them and say, hey, are these things that sometimes you feel? And allow them the opportunity to get this out of their head so they can begin to build a different narrative. Now, what is the third thing? Let's, let's move on. I got in a little tangent there, didn't I? Number three is using the sentence, I look forward to. And choosing the thing that you most look forward to about the event that you're about to go into. Quite a while ago now, I listened to something that Mel Robbins was talking to about her anxiety, and she was giving an example of flying a plane. She, I guess, had an intense anxiety and fear around flying in planes. And at that time in her life, she was in planes all the time. It was pre-pandemic. She was flying all over the place speaking. And she talked one time about how she had to attach herself to a strong feeling of looking forward to something in order to allow herself to take the steps that it took to walk into that plane and sit down. And she would think about a restaurant she was going to go to or a person she was going to see and begin to build excitement. Well, since I heard that, I've been utilizing that with kids. And I say, let's talk about what you look forward to. Now, when they're going to school, maybe they've found in their mind all the negative things about going to school. But guess what? There's always something in that day that they look forward to that they would miss out on when they're not there. Oh, it's a best friend that they get to sit by at lunch that they get to play with. Oh, it's an activity that's their favorite. It's a subject that's their favorite subject. Sometimes it's their teacher whatever that is, again, brighten that in your life by saying, I look forward to, and just refuse to let your mind continue on that narrative of the what ifs and the fears that could happen. And this could happen and that could happen. And all of these things that literally have never happened and interrupt it, just interrupt that fear. When you interrupt it, just like you would interrupt someone if they were um, putting down the person that you love the most and they were just, you know, calling them all kinds of names, you'd say, uh, excuse me, I'm going to interrupt you right there. You interrupt the voice 
that is sabotaging you and say, hold up, I'm going to interrupt you right there. 